Yeah, so obviously GPS uh, GPS units use them daily. Whatever capture any physical patterns, any motion, so anything that prevents basically supports injury prevention and improves performance. So we'll use it in a in a manner of things, and also it's a really good tool for us to add context to a lot of the work that we're doing. Mm. So when I was with the under 18s at the time, they they'd use it in, uh, in your training, your game, and they basically just use it for your AC ratios, uh, your acute chron chronic ratios, you want to monitor injury prevention and stuff like that. But again, we wanted to, uh, when I came in, we wanted to really replicate what we were doing in the age group above. So almost these under 18s, they're, they're, they'll be fine to play in the under 18s, but the goal is to get them to play for our first team. That is the end, that is the end goal. About once a week, I'd say at the time, we'd have under 18s going down to train with the first team. And the intensity levels and the difference, they wouldn't be able to keep up. They'd come down and it'd be there'd be times where they'd be going down and they might pick up a niggle because the the intensity that they're not used to. Mm -hmm. So it's almost we're using the the GPS metrics to see right, like, what are the under 18s doing currently? What are we doing? What are our per minute values when training on a on a match day plus two, a match day minus two, etc. What the under twenty three value is doing on a match day plus two minus two whatever, and what the first team doing. Mm. At the time when I jumped walls, it was Nuno, and the uh, the philosophy of playing three at the back, five at the back, was passed down throughout every age group. So the under twenty three is a player, the under eighteen is a player, and what would that look like from a physical perspective? So we'd look at previous success stories. Morgan Gibbs White, a really good example. He shot through to the first team when he was a, a really young age. That was a success story for the club. What did he look like when he was 16? What did he look like when he was 17? And that comes from the GPS stuff. That look comes from his match data. That comes from his physical testing stuff. Of what, what was he jumping? What were his uh, ISO scores, etc. So what did that look like at that age group? What At what point did he have to get to in order to cope, not just cope, but excel in the intensity mm. at the end of 23s? And then get the trust to play at the in the first team as well. So it's not just this is he, he can cope at this at this intensity. Can he still produce quality into fatigue during that intensity? Mm -hmm. So on a on a really tough day, so match day minus three or match day minus four day, we'd uh, say or talk to coaches, right, it'd be really good to replicate some match intensity today if possible. So we'd uh we'd we'd come up with a drill uh where we'd have to we'd, we'd It'd be a short time, but we want to hit match intensity for around two minutes. So we'd have the live data. We could track every single player, and that's completely relative to their position to where they're playing. Yeah. So when looking at a pressing drill, are the defenders getting up with the patterns? Of, are they getting up with the team? Are they hitting the, let's say, a metric, a high metabolic load, HML? For a team, on average, at the time in the under-18s, 23 HML per minute was the match intensity. So in a training session, when we're looking to hit match intensity, every player on the on the live had to basically hit that and we were monitoring that for almost like a 10 minute drill if that makes yeah, sense yeah. and then we'd periodize the rest of the session however it needed to be but we're hitting match intensity at some point on a heavy day and then bit by bit we started doing that more regularly and we saw improvements in the game we saw them when they were going down to the first team they were coping a bit better we were like, getting less injury situations when they're going up to the 23s now once we started hitting the 18 match demands we started targeting the 21 demands, the under 23 demands, sorry. Mm -hmm. So we'd build the the time blocks as we were doing. We'd start off with an eight-minute pressing period. Then when we were comfortable, we'd move to a 10-minute pressing period, then 12-minute pressing period. So we're actually progressively overloading that time. Mm -hmm. And then once we were ready, we'd drop the time again, and then we'd increase the intensity. We'd increase it to 23's intensity. So we're almost increasing it to 25 HML per minute this time. So mm -hmm. we're still getting that that volume into the players, and that is one of the main strengths we got from the GPS at the time in the under-18s. That was one of the main differences I'd like to think I brought in when I, when I first came in. And we are actually looking at the data a bit more. Mm -hmm. The thing is with GPS in games in data in general in games there's so much context behind every game and a lot of, I've worked with coaches who just because the numbers are low they didn't work hard enough but that that isn't true there's so much context behind what you're doing I mean you could control you could be 4 0 up at half time and you're just controlling the game um in the second half you've got a lot of the ball 
uh, and it doesn't mean you know it might mean that your sprint distance is low. The beauty of first game data now we've got second spectrum, so you can look at your in the possession and out of possession for games as well. And there's more context being added, and then you're linking it to your stats bomb stuff. Um, but you can almost use data to tell a story. I know a lot of coaches will take the GPS data depending depending on the <laughs> on the result of a Saturday and say, look. We lost 3 0 because we didn't run hard enough. Look, yeah. we didn't run hard enough, but at the same time, we could have the same numbers next week, but yeah. we won 3 0. 